So we will go ahead and get started. Good Monday morning to you all. Thanks for joining us. My name is Heather Miller. I'm an adult programming librarian here at the La Crosse Public Library. And I'm so glad you could join us for Monday mornings at Maine online edition. Uh, today, we have Michael Edmonds with us. And Michael is a writer and public historian from Madison, Wisconsin. And his writings on history, nature, and folklore explore ways that ideas have moved through time and space in oral, printed, and digital form. And today, he'll be speaking to us about odd Wisconsin, true tales, and folklore from the Badger State. So take it away, Michael. Thanks for joining us. OK. <clears throat> As Heather said, if you have questions, you can either uh, hold them to the end. I'll be happy to stay after 11. Um, or you can submit them through chat, and she'll keep an eye on that and interrupt me if necessary. I'm going to go and uh, share my screen so you can see my presentation instead of my pandemic lack of haircut. Let me minimize some of this other stuff that's in the way. Okay, Heather, are you seeing the screen, right? Looks great. Okay. Um, today's talk is called Odd Wisconsin, an unconventional look at our state's history. And it's based on some programming I did when I worked at the Wisconsin Historical Society over the last couple decades. Uh, Roger Daltrey of The Who famously said, uh, history was the most boring thing I've ever sat through in my life when he was in school. And I think we've all had that experience. He said it was about as exciting as a clam race. All they wanted to talk about was numbers and dates. It had ceased to be about people. Well, that is indeed how they teach history, especially to children. It's a terrible thing. And at the Wisconsin Historical Society, we thought that digital technology 20, 25 years ago gave us the ability to tell other kinds of stories, to actually put people into, uh, into history in ways that everyday people like you and me would enjoy. And when we look at the past and think of who lived, this is the kind of stereotype we have that they were all virtuous patriarchs and such. But in fact, they were just regular people like we are. Uh, they were as smart as we are and they faced equally great challenges, maybe even greater challenges. But they were not all um, dowdy or uh, formal or righteous patriarchs and matriarchs. There were just as many eccentrics and weirdos long ago as there are today. So uh, some colleagues and I thought we could get the stories of those people out of the archives and share them with the world. And uh, maybe that would make people happier about history. So we started a blog back in 2005 called Odd Wisconsin that turned into a newspaper column Maybe some of you remember it, it was syndicated all over the state. And um, that turned into a book. My colleague Erica Janik down at the bottom left turned some of those stories, which appeared every week in the newspaper, uh, into a, a best-selling book for the Historical Society. And then 10 years later, another colleague and I, Sam Snyder and I, rewrote some of them as full-length cradle-to-grave biographies of people and published them in this book. So if you like what you hear today, you could um, go order those books from your favorite independent bookstore and they'll, they'll mail them out to you, I'm sure. Um, you know, this makes me remember something I meant to mention at first. If you want to take notes while I'm talking, maybe the best way to do that is just to do a screen capture and save the image or to keep your phone handy and just shoot an image of the screen. All the information on these screens will be large enough so you can refer back to it later. So um, shoot an image of this if you think you might want to follow up by reading these books. So today's talk is about uh, Wisconsin history and Wisconsin is obviously on that map there. Its history began 12 or 13,000 years ago, but written records only began about 400 years ago when the first written records were created in the 1600s, there were lots of thriving Native American communities in the state. Here are ones that we know existed because archeologists have explored them. And then here are some more that we know existed because the French left written accounts of them. Some of them were very large, you know, up there on Madeline Island where, where perhaps you've been in the summertime was um, 
an Ojibwe community of, of over 3,000 people. And when Father Marquette and Louis Joliet came down to uh, cross the state and explore the Mississippi River, there were 3,000 Indians living at Marinette when they passed. Historians estimate that uh, when the French arrived in Green Bay, there were about 15 to 20,000 people within a day's walk of Green Bay. So the French didn't come in and find the place empty. They came in and found thriving communities. That didn't keep them from declaring it was part of France. And they just claimed it anyway. Here's uh, Louis XIV who built Versailles, who was in charge of uh, Wisconsin for much of the time of the fur trade. The French envisioned a great arc of trading posts of settlements that started up in the upper right there when they entered the St. Lawrence Valley, St. Lawrence River Valley in 1534. And they spread down the St. Lawrence across the Great Lakes into Wisconsin in the 1630s. You know, really, um, the first Frenchman to arrive in 1634 was kind of a loner. Nobody else came for 25 years after that. And the fur trade doesn't get underway until the 1660s. And that's when uh, La Salle builds forts all down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. So Wisconsin was right in the pivot here of French exploration and trade. When the French arrived, they found lots of people here. There were the Menominee who uh, were in Northeastern Wisconsin where they had been forever since the glaciers left. The Ho-Chunk occupied central Wisconsin including lots of places in the Fox Valley. The Dakota spilled over from the plains across the Mississippi into Northwestern Wisconsin. And the Ojibwe occupied much of the Northern forest where they, where they are today. But the French also found in the middle 1600s, all these other nations who had been pushed into Wisconsin because of warfare further east. So Wisconsin was a very multicultural place. There were many different peoples living here. They didn't speak the same languages. They couldn't even talk to each other. They were all vying for scarce resources because of thousands of refugees pushed into Wisconsin. Uh, during the 1650s, 60s, 70s. Well, the French established missions as well as trading posts at the yellow dots you're seeing populating. Um, and priests came out in order to convert the uh, American Indians who were here or at least save their souls if they couldn't convert them. And most of what we know about Wisconsin's uh, earliest years in the 1600s, earliest years of settlement, are from these annual reports that the Jesuits sent back. Uh, in English, that says uh, a relation of what the most remarkable things that happened in the missions of the Jesuit fathers in New France. And they sent one of these back every year. So at all of those yellow dots, there were people with pens and, pen and ink trying to write up what happened and sending it back. So these are marvelous eyewitness accounts. They've been translated into English and they're all available online if you want to read them. So from that, um, from those records, I've pulled out one priest, Father Louis Nicolas, um, because he was kind of eccentric. We think of these people as um, devout, uh, long-suffering martyrs. Many of them did die. Many of them were tortured. Um, it, it was a true calling. Uh, Father Marquette is the best known, and uh, he was certainly one of the pious ones. Uh, Louis Nicolas was different. Uh, his teachers thought that he was more fit for manual labor than for entering the priesthood, and there's no uh, record that he ever converted anybody. But he was sent at the end of the 1660s um, to Ashland, to Madeline Island in the Apostle Islands, the islands you see off Ashland there on the left, uh, where he was supposed to minister to the refugees who'd been pushed out from the east, as well as the Ojibwe and the Odawa and other nations who had always inhabited the lakes. But he was arrogant and he was a bully and he wasn't really interested in religion that much. What he was interested in was natural history. He carried a large book with him in which he made sketches of all of the animals and birds and plants 
of the new world. And his goal was to create what today we'd think of as a great uh, natural history of the Americas. Uh, he made himself so unwelcome that the Jesuits had to recall him and they kept him back in Montreal for a while and they sent him to New York and they sent him out to Nova Scotia, but he eventually was sent back to France where he worked for the rest of his life on this gigantic book, um, which then nobody would publish. So it was only found in the 20th century and reprinted, uh, printed for the first time as a book. The whole thing's also available online. But it, he was the first person to try to catalog all the plants and animals of our part of the world. Um, a few decades later, in the middle of the 18th century, further south, the Ho-Chunk were led by a, a woman chief whose name has been translated as Glory of the Morning. Uh, she was the wife of a French trader who left to go back to Canada when war broke out, and she became the head of the Ho-Chunk community on Doty Island at Nina Menasha. It looks something like this. Um, she had a very delicate diplomatic and political role to fill because the French with their guns and their metal goods uh, and their alcohol had taken over much of the power structure of Wisconsin. But they did that in order to get furs and only the native hunters could provide them with furs. So there was a delicate balance. They, all the native tribes resisted French domination, but at the same time, they were dependent on French material goods. And the French wanted the wealth that was in the, in the interior, but they couldn't, so they couldn't afford to alienate the Native Americans. And then among the different tribes, there was competition for furs and other natural resources. So um, it was a political situation that should be very familiar, very modern, where many different political forces had to be navigated by glory of the morning. She was visited um, in 1776 by the person who wrote the first book about Wisconsin. Do I have his picture here? I do. Jonathan Carver, uh, who came this way in the mid-1760s. And he wrote, uh, on the 25th of September, I arrived at the great town of the Winnebago's situated on a small island just as you enter the east end of Lake Winnebago. Here the queen who presided over this tribe received me with great civility and entertained me in a very distinguished manner. She was very small in stature and not much distinguished by her dress from several young women that attended her. Her attendants seemed greatly pleased whenever I showed any tokens of respect. Um, the woman on the left on your screen is not her, Photography had not been invented in the 1760s, but she may have looked like this or worn traditional clothing like this. This woman is three or four generations um, down from Glory of the Morning, Ho-Chunk woman. Glory of the Morning lived to be more than 100. She died uh, around 1830. Ho-Chunk oral tradition says she was outside among the pines one winter day when an owl perched nearby called her name, which was an omen of approaching death. And that night she wrapped herself in furs and passed away with a smile on her face. A blizzard hit the village that night and the rare sound of snow thunder was heard. Her people assumed it was her Thunderbird clan spirits calling her home. That uh, image is rock art from uh, several centuries before of a Thunderbird. Now, the economy of Wisconsin, everything in Wisconsin in the 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s, revolved around beavers the way that today it revolves around oil, unless it revolves around big data now. I'm not sure about that. Um, and the furs were desirable because they were the raw material for hats that were worn everywhere uh, across Europe. The red lines on this map show how the French came into this part of the world, where their major trading posts were, uh, and how they got the furs out. The furs were transported in very large canoes like these uh, that were paddled a thousand miles at a time in order to get uh, a winter's worth of furs back to Montreal. They were made into hats like these. These are um, late 18th, early 19th century hats. And if you think about it, 200 years ago, most people worked outdoors. They were not factories and offices. Uh, most people farmed or worked at some craft that was 
done outdoors a lot of the time. So a good hat was an important piece of equipment. And they might be stylish, like some of the ones in that little photo, uh, but they had to be functional too. And beavers, the pelts being waterproof, um, made wonderful hats. So huge fortunes were made in the fur trade. The fur trade was French and then later English, but the first African-Americans to come to Wisconsin were involved in the fur trade. This is um, one of them, Stephen Bonga, uh, who lived until the late 19th century. His uh, grandparents had come to Mackinac at the lower right here with the English in the mid 18th century. And when the English left, they were freed. They had been enslaved and they were freed and they set up an inn. Their son, one of their sons, moved to um, the Duluth area where Henry Schoolcraft, the writer down at the lower left, the little postage size stamp, visited. Uh, and Schoolcraft wrote in the early 19th century, three miles above the mouth of the St. Louis River, there's a village of Chippewa Indians containing a population of about 60 souls. Among these, we noticed a Negro who has long been in the service of the fur company and has four children who are as black as the father and have the curled hair and glossy skin of the native African. One of their, these kids was Stephen, whom you see on the left there, who worked as a voyager, a guide, an interpreter, and a clerk for various fur trade companies during the first half of the 19th century. Uh, a lake in northern Minnesota has been named for him and his family. He liked to make the paradoxical claim that he was, quote, the first white child born at the head of the lakes, meaning he was the first non-Indian child. He died in 1884 near Superior. And uh, as I say, that lake up north of there is named for him. We'll return to other earlier African-American Wisconsin settlers later on. Well, as the fur trade began to wind down in the early 19th century, the War of 1812 broke out. And when it was over, the US government decided it needed a line of forts to make sure that the wealth of the interior flowed to uh, American merchants rather than flowing north into Canada and then to English merchants. So between 1820 and 30, they built a number of forts, Fort Howard at Green Bay, Fort Winnebago at Portage, Fort Crawford down in Prairie du Chien, uh, Fort Snelling up in the Twin Cities and um, down at Chicago, the fort whose name I'm forgetting right now, Fort, well, never mind. You can see what the goal was, was to control trade here. Soldiers were positioned at all of these forts. They needed services, including medical care. And so doctors came among them, including the guy in the middle here, William Beaumont. Beaumont was uh, a military doctor in the 30s, 1830s and 40s. And um, he was called in 1822 to a horrible accident when the voyager, the French fur trader on the left there, Alexis St. Martin, was accidentally shot in the side, blew a hole in his side. And Beaumont treated him, but the hole never completely healed up. Uh, so there was always an entry right into St. Martin's stomach. Beaumont, being a man of science, took this opportunity to study how digestion worked. Uh, St. Martin was unable to, import, to support himself anymore in the fur trade, so he became kind of a servant in Dr. Beaumont's house. And for the next 15 years or so, he did anything the doctor needed, including opening this flap in his side so the doctor could dangle in bits of beef on a string, pulling them out after one, two, or three hours to see what had happened to them, once he put in 12 raw oysters. Uh, they lived variously at Green Bay and Prairie du Chien and elsewhere around the lakes. In 1833, Beaumont published the results of his experiments on St. Martin's innards, experiments and observations on the gastric juice and the physiology of digestion, which was the first time anybody really understood how digestion worked, because never before in the history of science had anyone been able to observe it in action. St. Martin lived for 47 more years with the hole in his side. He had several children and near the end of his life, he reportedly became, quote, very much addicted to drink. When he died in 1880, his family thought he'd suffered enough indignities and they buried his body in an unmarked grave. So no more experiments 
could be performed on it. Well, the forts were there um, to ensure that trade flowed, but they were also there to maintain peace between the native peoples who inhabited the upper Mississippi Valley because all, nobody could make any money off the furs or the other resources up here if there was constant war warfare. So in 1825, the government called a great council of all the nations of the upper Mississippi at Prairie du Chien, and you see that depicted here. Uh, it set up boundaries you see on the right in 1825, but then um, it's, the US started to make treaties with all of the tribes independently. And eventually all of Wisconsin was carved up in the way you see on the left under treaties that ceded Indian homelands to the US government so it could be sold over to pioneer settlers. The native peoples only did this because in 1832, the Sauk resisted uh, US incursion into their homelands under the leader Black Hawk. And in a matter of weeks, the US government and local militia uh, defeated Black Hawk as he and a few hundred warriors retreated through the center of Southern Wisconsin and over to the Mississippi to try to escape and get back into Iowa or Minnesota. Um, that war was characterized by massacres and brutality that the Indians in this part of the world had never seen before. Uh, both the militia and the US troops ignored white flags of surrender, um, refused to meet with Indian uh, sock uh, emissaries sent to, to treat for peace. And um, when they got to the Mississippi, cornered the Black Hawk and troops and hundreds of civilians between a bluff on the Wisconsin side and the river in the middle with a gunboat on it and simply massacred hundreds of non-combatants. Um, this not only settled the issue for the Sauk and Fox, it taught all the Indians nearby that white people were not to be trusted and that uh, there was no point in trying to resist US incursion into Wisconsin. So gradually all of the land between 1832 and 1854 that had been Indian homelands was turned over to the US by a number of treaties. Uh, there were dozens of them, about a dozen big ones that reduced the size of Indian homelands to the reservations we know today. The Ho-Chunk did not get a reservation. Um, they were rounded up during the 1830s and 40s and 50s and marched at gunpoint first across into uh, Iowa, then to short-lived reservations in Minnesota, finally ending up in Nebraska, the red dot at the bottom left where most of the uh, tribe lives today. Many of the Ho-Chunk, however, refused to go. They preferred to live where their people had always lived and to die where their ancestors had died. And so they tried to live underground. Um, one of their leaders was this Ho-Chunk chief, um, Monopeonik, who's known to the whites under the name Dandy. Um, he was the leader of a band excuse me, a band living on the Baraboo River. The Ho-Chunk were decentralized. They had no capital and no single leader like many other Native American peoples. They lived in small communities, each of which was independent. He was, Dandy was in charge of the largest of these um, in the 1830s and 40s. After the Black Hawk War, all the Ho-Chunk leaders signed a treaty forcing them to go across the river, but he refused to go and lived on the run like many of his people. In 1844, troops caught up with him near Baraboo, shackled him in chains, and brought him to territorial governor Henry Dodge, whom you see here at Mineral Point. One eyewitness recalled that the chief produced a Bible and asked the governor if it was a good book. Surprised, the governor answered that it was. Then said Dandy, if a man could do all that was in that book, could any more be required of him? Receiving a no for an answer, he continued, well, look that book all through. And if you find in it that Dandy ought to be removed by the government to Turkey River, I will go. But if you don't find that, I'll stay here. Well, Governor Dodge was not amused and uh, ordered Dandy brought in shackles to Fort Crawford here at Prairie du Chien. 
the shackles blistered his legs and he said he couldn't walk because he was so injured. The, do the soldiers didn't dare remove them though, so whenever he needed to move anywhere, a corporal had to carry him. After several weeks, the order finally came that he should be transported to Iowa, and the corporal, believing that Chief Dandy couldn't walk, carried him to a buggy, went back for his whip. But as soon as the soldier's back was turned, the chief leaped out and disappeared up the bluffs. He never did go west, like hundreds of uh, his fellow Ho-Chunk, but lived as a fugitive in Western Wisconsin. He died in 1870 at the age of 77 near Petenwell Bluff near Nesita. Well, during those years, Wisconsin was turning into um, the place we know today. In 1839, there were very few white settlers and they were mostly down in the Southwest where there was lead. At Milwaukee, there was one fur trader's cabin. But 10 years later, after most Native American tribes had been removed to reservations or pushed west, this bottom third here in the southeast third had been surveyed and sold to settlers. And a few years after that, it had been surveyed all the way to the limits of the forest in the north. <coughs> to make this um, a little more easy to comprehend, the population of Wisconsin did this over those years. It doubled between 1820 and 1830. It grew tenfold between 30 and 40 and tenfold again by 1850. And then it doubled again. So there's just this explosion of pioneer settlers, white people coming into Wisconsin during the middle of the 19th century. Now, as I said at the outset, they weren't all, you know, these um, <clears throat> eminent Victorians like we, may have been taught they were in school. One of them um, who's a good example was the early Milwaukee settler, Julius McCabe. He had come from Ireland at the end of the 18th century and gradually wandered west until he reached Milwaukee. His neighbors said he was, quote, as a restless waif who floated around the world with the kindest temper, the most inexhaustible loquacity, the most rollicking humor, and the most inappeasable thirst in frontier Milwaukee. He arrived there around 1840 and claimed to have written city directories for several cities in the Eastern Lakes and said that he was going to compile a gazetteer of the whole state of Wisconsin. So he spent some, uh, some months wandering the state, gathering information on towns and villages, collecting a dollar each from more than 2000 subscribers. Those who knew him were not surprised that the book was slow to appear. The press called him, quote, too lazy to work, too proud to beg and afraid to steal, though there is some doubt about the latter. When he ran for local office in 1844, his own political party denounced him as, quote, a fitter subject for a jail than for the legislature. But two years later, he did manage to turn out a guide to Milwaukee, the first listing of all the people and all the streets uh, the street naming and numbering systems can be traced back to this. He listed over 2,000 residents and 92 pages of ads. McCabe died on the morning of uh, July 26, 1849, after a night-long binge. His body was discovered on the porch of a hotel and was buried in a potter's field. The Daily Wisconsin newspaper reported, quote, his sudden death is not so much surprising as that he should have lived so long. <clears throat> At the opposite end morally of that spectrum, but equally expensive, uh, equally eccentric, was Warren Chase. He was born in New Hampshire, orphaned and gradually made his way west, got involved in various utopian causes like the anti-slavery movement and the women's rights movement and mystical Christianity. Um, he, with some friends from Racine, set up a commune based on the principles of uh, Charles Fourier, a, a mid 19th century French uh, political thinker, at Ripon in 1846, eight, let's say 1844. Labor was voluntary, profits were all owned in common, all decisions were made democratically and members swore off alcohol, gambling, and all other vices. 
the commune lasted for six years until they all decided that was long enough and they broke it up. Before that happened, they elected Chase to go to Madison in 1846 to help write the first constitution of the state. At that meeting, he argued that African Americans should be allowed to vote and that women, women should be allowed to own property. At the time, any property that a woman inherited or any wages that she earned legally belonged to her husband or nearest male relative. Women were not allowed to own any property. But these ideas were much too radical and that constitution was rejected and the one we live in live under today was uh, set up in its place. Chase was a mystical uh, seeker and a religious fanatic as well. He wrote an autobiography. Do I have a picture of that? I think I do. Yeah, he wrote an autobiography which is half about his politics and half about his religion. In it he called the lowest form of religion the worship of a single God. The next highest form was pantheism, which recognized that many religions were trying to express the same truth. The highest form, quote, to which I have now so legitimately arrived, he called harmonialism. And he said that that allowed people to experience God directly in everyday life, seeing the world around them as a physical expression of the divine mind. For the rest of his life, Chase traveled the country lecturing on how to achieve that state of mind. Ultimately, he ended up like so many people who couldn't conform to mainstream values in California. And he died, presumably entering a different plane of existence in 1891. Uh, finally, a third person on that great wave of pioneer settlers was the state's first governor, Nelson Dewey. <clears throat> Dewey, um, Dewey settled in Cassville near the Mississippi, uh, in the farm that you see here. <coughs> Excuse me, having trouble with my throat this morning. Uh, and he expected it to become the capital of Wisconsin because at the time, Wisconsin territory spread across the river and embraced all of Iowa and South Dakota as well. But in fact, when Wisconsin territory was set up, the borders were set at Mississippi and Madison was named the capital. Um, in 1848, when Wisconsin joined the, the state, uh, joined the United States, um, Dewey was the uh, was chosen the Democratic Convention's candidate for governor because there was so much infighting that two main candidates couldn't get a majority. And to everybody's surprise, he won the popular election and became governor. Uh, here's the house he built at Cassville after it burned down. This is his gubernatorial portrait. From 1848 to 52, he tried to establish a clean, efficient state government relentlessly, according to a friend, chain smoking cheap cigars and never hesitating to call the average grafter a damned scoundrel. His most lasting legacy may be the state's motto, forward. <coughs> he, he, um, he, produced, he proposed forward, but the Supreme Court Justice Edward Ryan wanted Excelsior engraved on the state seal. The two of them ran into each other accidentally while visiting New York City, sat down in a doorway and fought it out. Dewey, who was remembered as not being an easy man to get along with and bound to have his way, prevailed and so forward the state went. But that didn't, being the state's first governor, didn't guarantee fame or fortune for Dewey. Uh, he, he eked out a living as an attorney, but he lost his savings, his home, even his family in a series of disasters. In old age, he was given a sinecure as a prison inspector and lived out of a suitcase, sleeping on cots in the state's jails as he inspected them. He finally died with that great beard in 1889. One friend mused that most Wisconsin residents probably did not know whether he was living or dead. Well, Dewey's um, governorship and statehood preceded this great turmoil of the Civil War, in which, uh, in which Wisconsin played a prominent part. Uh, you've probably heard of the Iron Brigade and Old Abe, the, the War Eagle. Most of Wisconsin was populated by recent immigrants, many of them from Europe, 
And they had come to America to join the experiment in democracy. When the war broke out, they saw that as a threat on this great um, democratic with a small d ideal. And so many troops, uh, many regiments were composed of troops who weren't even Native Americans, but people who had come from other countries. One of these was Colonel Hugh Lewis, who had emigrated from England, <coughs> from Wales, shortly before the Civil War broke out. He enlisted in the Iron Brigade. Um, these are some officers from the brigade shown here. He's not one of them, I don't think. And the following year, he was shot in the left elbow at the Second Battle of Bull Run. Medics amputated his lower arm. He was sent to Wisconsin, he was sent to Washington to recover, but gangrene set in and the rest of his arm had to be taken off at the shoulder. Surgeons sent this second piece of his arm to the Smithsonian Museum to illustrate modern medical science. Because until the Civil War, if you amputated someone's limbs, they died. They bled to death or infection set in. One of the great medical advancements of the war was the ability to perform amputations. Another was embalming. The, uh, the practices we have around uh, how to treat people who have died were invented during the Civil War. Well, for years afterwards, Lewis was bothered by phantom pains in his missing arm. One day, his daughter visited the Smithsonian and saw, and saw his arm standing upright in a bottle. She remembered his pains and asked the museum staff to please lay it down when the pain went away. As he grew older, Lewis decided that when he died, he wanted his arm to be buried with the rest of him. So he asked for it, but the Smithsonian replied that unfortunately they couldn't find it. After much searching, they discovered it had been shipped to Canada for display at McGill University. What business have you to send my arm off to a foreign country, Lewis demanded, when it was lost for the United States? His arm was eventually recovered and sent to him in Madison. When it arrived, he had a tiny coffin made for it. <clears throat> in 1919, he finally died from the Spanish flu during the epidemic we've been hearing so much about and was finally buried with his long lost arm in Madison's Forest Hill Cemetery. The years after the Civil War were dominated by the logging industry, which succeeded uh, the fur trade as the main economic driver of life in Wisconsin. You see here the rivers of northern Wisconsin on which logging took place. Lumberjacks would go north into the woods far from any road or railroad around Thanksgiving time and erect a, a, a shanty like you see here to sleep in and another one to eat in. And then they'd spend all daylight hours out in the woods taking down trees, uh, which they'd pile on fro the frozen river uh, until spring when they'd take it downstream to lumber mills where it'd be sawed up and then sold off. Uh, this went on, as you can see on the screen, for about 30 years. And it ended because they made most of northern Wisconsin look like this. Uh, by 1920, virtually all of the us most usable, marketable timber was gone. When you would go up north today, the trees that we see today were generally planted in the 1930s and 40s. There are small patches of forests that were never cut, but most of Wisconsin's great pine trees were killed off as thoroughly as the buffalo on the Great Plains. One of the people involved in that was this man, Gene Shepard. I bet that some of you have heard of the Hodag. Um, Gene Shepard was a timber cruiser and a Northwoods booster who, based out of Rhinelander, a great practical joker, and also a really good logger and logging crew um, foreman. His best known prank was exhibiting a live hodag, a ferocious mythical beast that resembles a cross between a wild boar and a hungry alligator at the 1896 Oneida County Fair. He fabricated the animal from cowhide and cattle horns and made it move with hidden strings. Hundreds of fairgoers paid to see the famous beast, but they could only be admitted for a moment, ostensibly for their own safety. It was so successful that a lumber trade journal reported on it, and then East Coast newspapers mistakenly thought the hodag was a new discovery of science, because in the 1880s, science was discovering all sorts of new things. Uh, 
Shepard was, of course, delighted, but he confessed that it was just a hoax. And then even more people came to see it because it was the most successful hoax that the nation had ever known. Bunyan also invented this guy, told the first stories about Paul Bunyan. And uh, Paul Bunyan went on in the first half of the 20th century to be America's best known folk hero. To Shepard and the lumberjacks that he told the stories to, Bunyan didn't look like this, he looked like this after six months in the woods. <coughs> a contemporary of Shepard's in the uh, post-Civil War era was this woman, Julia Severance, a Wisconsin feminist and physician. She was raised a Quaker in upstate New York where she embraced all sorts of social and religious reforms. As a teenager, she had a religious epiphany and embraced the anti-slavery movement, temperance, and women's rights. She was one of the first women to get an MD in America in 1858. But finding that scientific medicine didn't always work, she took up vegetarianism and psychic healing. Throughout her life, she provided free medical care to any working woman who asked for it. In 1862, she moved to Whitewater. We'll get back to this pamphlet in a sec. <coughs> because Whitewater was one of the nation's leading spiritualist centers. There was a, an institute formed there to train people how to become psychics and medians, mediums. And so she settled there and had a flourishing, flourishing practice. She advocated for the abolition of marriage, which she argued differed only superficially from prostitution and threatened women's moral, legal, medical, and spiritual well being. She demanded the absolute right in the pamphlet on the right there, the absolute right of every woman to live, quote, as her reason and conscience shall, de shall decide in all areas of life. When two persons are drawn together by reciprocal love and mutual desire, she wrote, that is a true union and all the laws that men can frame cannot make it unholy or immoral. Of course, she was attacked and persecuted. These were terrible things to say in public during the Victorian age. But the attacks rolled off her like water off a duck's back. After the Civil War, she moved to Milwaukee, where she kept up her medical practice and became active in the trade union movement. Uh, she was a reformer until the day she died in the year 1919, also from the Spanish flu. During those years, Wisconsin was run by one political party, the Republican Party. Uh, the Democrats had sided with the South. There were no Democrats to speak of in Wisconsin in the 1860s, 70s, 80s. They had no political power. And if you think of a one-party state being like Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union, that's how Wisconsin was run. Um, most Civil War veterans belonged to a veterans organization called the Grand Army of the Republic, the GAR, and its president was governor of Wisconsin, Lucius Fairchild, shown here. Anyone who wanted to succeed in politics came up through the GAR and the Republican Party. Here are <coughs> other political leaders of the post-war per period. You see them there in the dome of the Capitol that, uh, that burned down in 1904. The kingmaker behind the scenes was lumber baron Philetus Sawyer on the right. And no one could get on a ballot no one could be appointed to an office without the say show of these people. In the 1880s and 90s, um, younger people in the Republican Party took exception to this one party rule and the corruption that was inevitable, the bribery and, and anti democratic processes. The best known are Bob and Belle La Follette, who uh, by 1900 and 1904 had ousted the old stalwart Republicans and in the next 20 years put through lots of reforms like an open primary. You can go and vote in a primary because the La Follettes changed the rules. Before that, people just showed up on the ballot because they were chosen in smoke-filled rooms. The progressives outlawed child labor. When the Capitol burned in 1904, they built the one that we have today. They supported suffrage for women and got the vote for women in 1920. And they set up the, <coughs> the uh, Legislative Reference Bureau 
which pioneered the Wisconsin idea that bills should be written by experts, not lobbyists, but by experts, and they should be written to benefit all citizens, not just private interests. And this Wisconsin idea was imitated all over the country. Those were the years when Wisconsin's African American population began to grow rapidly. We talked about Stephen Bonga and his family in 18th and early 19th century Wisconsin, but the first black people to settle in Wisconsin arrived in 1724 as an, uh, enslaved workers with French troops. <coughs> the, uh, the other mentions of African Americans in early state history, they were in the Fox Valley, Green Bay and Mackinac. Of course, Chicago was founded by an African American fur trader. There were American, African American fur traders in Marinette in the 1780s and in Superior, the Bongas we talked about. There were dozens of African American uh, enslaved and free workers at the US forts and in the lead region in southwestern Wisconsin. So before there was anybody from Germany or Norway or the places we think of as characteristically Wisconsin, there were hundreds of black people also here. In 1850, a community of former slaves in southwestern Wisconsin sprung up at Pleasant Ridge uh, and had dozens of people. Uh, they had the first integrated schools in Wisconsin and uh, um, married with their white neighbors. In the Civil War, there was a regiment of black troops from Wisconsin. After the war, the black community in Milwaukee fell behind this fellow, Ezekiel Gillespie, and brought legal uh, brought a legal case that guaranteed black people the right to vote in Wisconsin in 1866. Unlike today, black people lived almost everywhere in Wisconsin. I want to go back there, sorry. Um, <clears throat> there were middle class black people in Black River Falls and Fond du Lac. Um, most county seats and other significant communities in Wisconsin had black neighborhoods. Uh, a recent book by a Harvard historian concluded that the mid Midwest was much better integrated in 1860 than it was in 1960. So how did that happen? Well, after the Civil War, laws were passed around the country um, that are called Jim Crow laws to limit the movement and opportunity for African Americans. Here in the center, you see the census totals for the city of Appleton. And in 1870, there were 16 black people, then 1918, you know, there's a little black community like I was talking about in Appleton. But then look, what happens after the turn of the century? Generally speaking, the black families leave. The reason for that is because many, many towns in, in Wisconsin passed what are called sundown laws, which did not allow people of color to remain inside the city limits after dark. And these sundown towns forced their black residents into the bigger cities so that uh, by the turn of the century, you get black communities in Milwaukee, Beloit, Janesville, um, Green Bay, Madison, larger than had been before. So at the, at the end of the 19th century, there's this great uh, compression, condensation, of black people into bigger cities. Some of the people who came during those years, who lived in Wisconsin during those years, were Sam and Sam Pierce and his mother Hetty. I got to scroll forward here um, in my notes. Sam, shown on the right, was born in 1870 in New Orleans. Uh, his mother said. No one in my family was ever sold. They wouldn't ever part with us because we did our work so good. About 1888, young Sam landed a job as a Pullman porter on long distance railroad trips, which was one of the few good jobs open to African-Americans in segregated America in those days. In 1905, he was assigned to the Chicago to Minneapolis route, which brought him into daily contact with Wisconsin officials moving between Milwaukee and Madison. <clears throat> 
One of them remembered him as, quote, definitely an optimist and a philosopher who made the best of things. His smile was contagious, his courtesy and diplomacy unfailing. In 1907, he brought his family, including his mother, whom you see here, to Madison. And in 1922, Governor John Blaine hired him to work in the governor's office. Pierce's job was to be Blaine's gatekeeper. Lobbyists, reporters, constituents, business mentors, self-promoters of all kinds always wanted to see the governor, and his job was to keep them out. Standing more than six feet tall, always dressed impeccably in a blue suit, he gently defended the governor from intruders. Years of experience as a Pullman porter had prepared him well. One visiting official recalled, he had a genius for avoiding offense. I called there three times, went in the front door, Sam and I talked, and as we were talking, we moved about. Sooner or later, I found myself going out the entrance. He wasn't trying to get me into the governor's office. He was just quietly oozing me out of the place. Another recalled, a gentle pat, a whisk of his hand at an imaginary fleck of dust, sent many of them away in a happy mood, even if they had failed to see the governor and were forced to conduct their affairs with some minor official. Sam Pierce served in this capacity for five different governors until his death in 1936. His mother outlived him. She was thought to be the oldest person uh, in Madison when this article was written. She survived all her children, and when she was 95 years old, traveled through the South alone, looking up her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She found 50 of them. In 1932, she told reporters, I've been in Madison for 25 years, and I like it, so I reckon I'll be here for 10 years more. In fact, she lived longer than that, long enough to celebrate her 115th birthday on January 1st, 1944. The last person I'd like to share with you is Mary Hayes Chenoweth, who was <clears throat> another of the 19th century's uh, mystics and mediums from Wisconsin. She wrote about her visions in uh, a newsletter and a pamphlet. I'm gonna read from um, her recollections. Just gonna find it here in the copy of the book. Quote, I was crossing the kitchen with a basin of water when suddenly some unknown force pressed me down upon my knees helpless. It was the spring of 1853. She was a 27 year old school teacher in Jefferson County. Of my own will, I could not move or see or speak, but a compelling power moved my tongue to prayer in languages unknown to me or to my father who was reading the Bible in the same room. This force told her she'd spend the rest of her life healing others and for the next half century, she devoted herself to the practice of spiritual medicine. <clears throat> she didn't believe in spiritualism or seances or Ouija boards. She thought they were all hoaxes. She relied instead on unique powers channeled through her by God, as she explained it. She possessed the ability to see directly into a patient's body and pinpoint the cause of illness. She then took the symptoms into her own body breaking out in blisters, rashes, or tumors while the patient recovered. She took no credit for her skills. It all came from outside. One day in the 1880s, the force told her to acquire land in northern Wisconsin, and her family went north and staked a claim to what became one of the largest and richest iron mines in the region. That allowed her, her family, and many of her followers to move to San Jose, California, where they founded a utopian commune called Edenvale. This uh, house is still there. If you have to go to San Jose for any reason, uh, you should visit it. <clears throat> for most of the next two decades, she treated 3,500 people a year, never accepting a fee for her services. According to eyewitnesses, cripples threw away their crutches and danced on the lawn. In 1905, she finally passed away, her body exhausted, but her spirit intact at the age of 80. So those are just some of the people described in those two books I was telling you about at the start. <clears throat> 
if you enjoyed their stories, um, you would enjoy these. I imagine, Heather, you've got copies of these books in your library if people don't want to uh, pick up copies on their own. We do indeed, yes. What's left? Finally, uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society, who's the publisher of those books, likes to know if people enjoy their talks. So snap a picture of this screen and um, sometime when you have a free moment or you just discover this in your photos, hop, to the, hop over to the web address you see there and fill out their little questionnaire. The first thing it asks for is an event ID number, which is that one on the screen. And now I'm happy to go to questions. Um, you, if you want to contact me, there's my email address. But why don't I minimize this screen and go back to talking live for questions? Michael, was there anything that surprised you when you were doing this talk? Um, you know, it's a good to be constantly reminded that there were have always been strange people um, and eccentric people who didn't fit in. Uh, I, I, the more I did this kind of research, the more I enjoyed it. Uh, Gary says here in chat, could I comment on itinerant Native American camps set up in Madison well into the early 20th century. Um, yes, Madison was an important um, site for the Ho-Chunk. They had a village uh, where the capital is today when white people arrived and had always had a capital directly to the south of it across Lake, not a capital, a village, uh, directly across the lake where Monona is today, where the Yahara flows out. And that, um, that area across the lake was not developed until the 20th century, well into the 20th century as the town of Monona. And the landowner there used to allow uh, Ho-Chunk families to come and spend the summer there where they had always spent the summer. There are burial mounds there going back more than a thousand years. Um, there were also smaller campsites around Lake Wingra by the zoo in Madison and the Arboretum and uh, Charles Brown, who was an anthropologist and archeologist a hundred years ago at the Wisconsin Historical Society, uh, would spend time with the Ho-Chunk who came there. And of course, in a sense, um, the, the Ho-Chunk are still there. There are many Ho-Chunk and, and members of other tribes living here in Madison today, uh, even in those very same areas, those same neighborhoods where there are, are burial mounds. Um, I, I have uh, several Native American colleagues and acquaintances who've bought houses in the areas where those summer camps were a hundred years ago and where uh, Native Americans were returning and burying their dead a thousand years ago. Okay. Well, you know, if we were meeting face to face, this is when, you know, we'd all kind of get up and stretch and, and Heather would have had uh, cookies and coffee for us at the back of the room or something. But instead of that, uh, I'm just going to click this red button down in the lower right. we we'll all go poof and it will be over. Thank you for coming and having comments and questions. You know how to get in touch with me or if you didn't record that, Heather can put you in touch with me again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for those fascinating portraits of real people who shape Wisconsin. And thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully you can join us next Monday morning where we'll be chatting with Maestro Alexander Platt from the LSO as we'll be exploring the genius of Beethoven. So see you all next week and take good care, everyone. Bye-bye.